Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of colors by the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment Color Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate President, Dr. Gene McCormick. Good morning, everyone. There's a little chill in the air, but there's a lot of warmth in our hearts that you came out to be with us today. On behalf of the Kennedy family, our board of directors, and all our wonderful staff, I want to welcome you to the dedication of the Edwin M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. This magnificent building was designed by renowned architect Raphael Venuli and constructed by Lee Kennedy and Associates. The dynamic exhibits inside were brought to life by the incomparable Ed Sloshberg and his design team, ESI. We are grateful to all of them for all of their work to create this incredible project and bring it to life. For so many of us, and many people have been inv involved in this journey to get here today, we are very grateful but for me, this journey is intensely personal. I grew up three miles from here on Downer Avenue. And let me tell you, when I was growing up, this area was a forbidden place. It was a landfill that fascinated children and frightened parents. Who could have imagined this landfill where we played as kids would become the home of a world-class university a gleaming presidential library, and the wonderful state archives. And now, the newest jewel in that crown, the glittering institute that you see behind you, behind me. 
You'll hear a lot today about the mission of the Institute to improve civic education and engage the next generation of leaders. This is what really speaks to me, that a girl from Dorchester who would grow up and be a university chancellor and have the chance to create the first public law school in Massachusetts, that speaks to the heart of equal opportunity and the path of education to make things possible for every succeeding generation. That's what the Institute is about. We're going to demonstrate the awesome power of our democracy, and we're going to light a fire in each and every person who walks through these doors. And I, for one, can't wait to get started. It is my great honor to be able to introduce Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston. I'm delighted that he was able to be with us this morning. Cardinal O'Malley and Senator Kennedy often traversed the same paths during decades of working for people they served. Cardinal O'Malley knew the District of Columbia well, having spent 20 years there advocating from immig for immigrants from Central America who sought refuge from political and military unrest. They, they came here to build a better country in, in for themselves and their families. And also, the Cardinal is well familiar with the parishes and homes of Hyannisport, having served as Bishop of the Archdiocese of Fall River during the 1990s. He joined the Kennedy family there and prayed with them at times of celebration and also in their most difficult moments. The Senator and the Cardinal were always committed to use the resources entrusted to their care for the good of others seeking to help people in their times of need. It was a blessing for me to have the opportunity to work with the Cardinal during my tenure as Chancellor at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and personally experience his care and concern for others. At this time, I'm very happy to invite Cardinal O'Malley to lead us in prayer. Thank you very much, Jean. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate Vicki Kennedy, the members of the Kennedy family, and all of those who have worked so hard to establish this magnificent institute. I'm sure that Senator Ted Kennedy would be most pleased with what you've achieved here today. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise and bless your holy name. You are the source of all good things, the gift of life, the gift of newness of life in our faith. As we invoke your blessings on all those gathered here to inaugurate this new Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, we ask you to enlighten and inspire the American people and our leaders to further the ideals of our democracy based on your Decalogue and on the unwavering conviction of the dignity of each and every human being. Enable us to work together for the common good, to communicate truth, to foster love, to uphold justice and right, to protect the weak and vulnerable, to raise up those who are oppressed and impoverished, and to ensure that all can partake of the blessings of creation and the dignity of work. May we strive tirelessly for that justice without which there can be no lasting peace and harmony. Help us to be committed to building a community based on solidarity and a lively sense of our shared destiny. Help us overcome all animosity, rivalries and prejudices the tear at the fabric of our humanity. Give us the courage and generosity needed to be artisans of peace. We implore you to make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. 
where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. It is my pleasure now to bring to the podium our wonderful partners from the University of Massachusetts, President Robert Carrett and Chancellor J. Keith Motley. Welcome to this uh, beautiful spring day in Columbia Point. As the uh, book says, Columbia Point, a decent place to live. I'm serving in three roles today, president of the University of Massachusetts, a founding board member of this wonderful institute, and a proud citizen of the Commonwealth and of this nation. Today, the missions of those institutions all intersect and leverage each other. The EMKI mission is to inspire the next generation of citizens and leaders to engage in the civic life of their communities. The UMass mission is to advance knowledge and to improve the lives of people, people of the Commonwealth, the nation, and the world. The UMass Boston mission is to help our students realize their potential and to assume the responsibilities of leadership and civic participation in this society. Our founding fathers recognized that education was the cornerstone of a strong democracy. Today, with the opening of this institute, we provide an invaluable resource to ensure that that cornerstone remains strong long into the future. On behalf of the University of Massachusetts, I bid you welcome here to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. Thank you for being with us. So um, thank you, President Correct. Good morning. Welcome to the celebration of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. And welcome to the campus of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Capital City Public Research University, the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I'm so glad. I am so glad you stopped in on such a wonderful day. It's always sunny out here on the peninsula. I'm also excited to welcome back President Barack Obama back to this university where he is, as a United States Senator, received an honorary degree from us. We're so grateful, just a few steps from here where we stand today. Of course, we also thank the First Lady, but we're also grateful to have our Vice President with us today. Thank you for being here. So, so I guess you can't tell that I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be able to welcome all of you to this momentous celebration, and I'm very proud to have the Edward M. Kennedy Institute on the campus of Boston's Public Research University. Now, I was thrilled, no, I was ecstatic when Senator Kennedy shared with me that he wanted to locate an institute focused on the United States Senate here on this campus where the vision of quality higher education is made accessible to persons who might otherwise have not had this opportunity in every day that's a reality here. That was his work, that's the work he cherished, and we are so grateful for that. American democracy is complicated, and the institutions that express our democracy are, in times, are at times cloaked with a certain mysteriousness that places them beyond the reach of the common citizen it serves. Senator Kennedy reached out to that common citizen. This institute will work to lift that veil of mystery and make accessible to the public and to future leaders the rich history, the complex operations, and the significant accomplishments of those most 
this most venerable institution that we call the United States Senate. I want to thank Dr. Victoria Reggie Kennedy, and yes, thank you, Vicki, but also the Kennedy family. I'm going to try to steal that blanket a little bit later <laughs> from you for entrusting this precious legacy and vision of Senator Kennedy to this project, to this institution, and to his people. We now regard this as a sacred responsibility to keep this standard high and to cast the seeds of his good work broadly. We joyfully celebrate the launch of a grand civic mission here today, and we welcome you all to the first of what we hope will be many visits to your campus and to this wonderful institute, positioned on this beautiful ocean front, looking out to the world as a great monument to a great man and great people who have served in the Senate, whose lives will impact us all for generations. Thank you for stopping by today. See you again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome EMK Institute board member, former Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle. As, as someone with the opportunity to serve on the Edward M. Kennedy Board, let me join in welcoming all of you here this morning. There have only been 1,963 men and women who have had the opportunity to serve in the United States Senate. Each of us, when we're sworn in, are given a number in sequence. Senator Kennedy's number is 1608. He was one of only eight people to serve more than 40 years in that institution. But regardless of how long any of us have served, we've all experienced the power and the majesty of the United States Senate. It is the ultimate arena for American democracy. We've all witnessed on the Senate floor how our decisions actually affect people's lives in a very profound way. And we want to replicate that experience in this extraordinary institution. Each of us who have been called to serve have had that moment when we were inspired to heed the call to public service. It may have been a teacher. It may have been a place. It may have been a leader. It may have been an event. But something triggered that desire to serve. That's exactly what we want to provide here. We want to provide that experience. We want to inspire, and we want to bring people to a realization they, too, could have one of those numbers someday. We've all seen the polls. We know how difficult it is to serve. We know people's confidence has declined in government and civic action. But we hope through this center we can change that by bringing the Senate alive, by bringing people to an appreciation of its relevance and its importance in everyone's life and how critical it is in this democratic republic. We can do that here. And so, in working with scholars and teachers and students and people all over the country and maybe even the world, maybe we can bring people to that aspiration. So as we celebrate this auspicious beginning, let us hope that it can be a transformational moment for some who walk through these doors. And I thank you all for coming and appreciate your collective support for Senator Kennedy's inspiring vision. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please welcome EMK Institute board member, former Senate Majority Leader, Trent Lott. Yes, a Republican from Mississippi. is proud to be here today, <laughs> and I enjoyed so much serving on the board of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. When I first talked to Vicki, I said, oh, Vicki, why me? <laughs> she said, well, you know, we need a little Republican representation, and I know you worked with Ted. So I said, well, tell me about it. And then she told me about the vision that Senator Kennedy had and that she had, and the Kennedy family had, with this great edifice here behind us. And I said, yes, this is a worthwhile project. There's nothing like this anywhere else in America to honor this great institution created in our Constitution, and one that Senator Kennedy dearly loved and made a better place when he was there. Oh, yes, we disagreed. <laughs> we had some fiery discussions. But we came together many times in a bipartisan way to get a result for America. He knew how to give and take and get a result. I must say also here today that I thought it was important we have somebody that could speak Southern other than Vicky. <laughs> and I now know why all the Kennedys have so much hair. It's to keep their head warm. My apologies for not bringing a 75 degree temperature in Jackson, Mississippi today here with me. I'm just going to tell you one story. When I was majority leader in 1997, the uh, legislation that would bring uh, to being the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was uh, gridlocked in the Senate. I guess you know that word now. We have a lot of gridlock. But I thought it was something that needed to be done. It was not partisan. It wasn't regional. It was about people that had needs and could be helped. And so I started working with Senator Kennedy, and sure enough, we got it done. Then he came to my, my leader office, and uh, he was very generous in his remarks about how we had worked together and uh, wanted me to go to the bill signing at the White House, and I told him, well, I thought maybe I'd pass on that. But I wrote him a letter thank, telling him how much I enjoyed working with him and that how proud I was that we got a result for individuals with disabilities and their need for education. And at the bottom, I wrote more or less a PS, and I said, if the world only knew, dash, dash, dash. I didn't know it for many years, but he framed that letter and hung it on his wall. I didn't actually want the world to know. <laughs> I have a feeling he's laughing broadly somewhere <laughs> right now. Well, we worked on a lot of things together. One of the last things I worked with him on was immigration reform in 2007. We worked together, and, and uh, we tried our best, and we lost on a procedural vote. I went up to him afterwards and said, and I, I got a couple of threats to my life on that one. I said, you know, Ted, every time I work with you, I get in trouble, man. <laughs> but just think how different things would be now if we had passed immigration reform in 2007. <laughs> and so this institution is dedicated to the history and the preservation of the United States Senate. Irish eyes are smiling today, and I have a feeling that the spirit of Ted Kennedy, that indomitable spirit, will reside in this building in its heart in the Senate in perpetuity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Martin J. Walsh. Thank you very much. 
I know the President's on his way, so Mr. President, Ms. Obama, Mr. Vice President, Governor Baker, United States Senators, elected and appointed officials, Cardinal O'Malley, distinguished guests, welcome to Kennedy Country. <laughs> Vicki, Teddy, Patrick, and your families, Kara's families, and all the family members and colleagues and friends of Senator Kennedy who are here, welcome home. It is with tremendous pride that I and the people of Boston accept the honor of hosting Senator Kennedy's living legacy. The Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, like the great presidential library next door, is truly home here at Columbia Point by Dorchester Bay in the city of Boston. Let me tell you how I know this. I was born nearby in the same St. Margaret's Hospital where Senator Kennedy came into the world. As a child, I walked this shore and listened to my mother, an Irish immigrant, share stories of the Kennedy family standing up for people like us. And then I learned it firsthand. As a young man, I went to the dedication of the Wells Avenue and Harley Street in Dorchester to Rose Kennedy. It was where my predecessor, Mayor John F. Fitzgerald, built a home for his family and raised his graceful daughter, Rose. Honey Fitz made Boston more inclusive. He went to Congress and fought to protect immigrants against hatred. We heard the echoes whenever Senator Kennedy stood up for justice and wherever he sang Sweet Adeline. On that day in Cardman Square, I talked to Honey Fitz's grandson, Rose's son, the Lion of the United States Senate, Edward Moore Kennedy. He wasn't larger than life that day. He was down on the corner to honor his mother like any good Irish boy from the neighborhood. He listened to us. He talked with us. He was at home with us. So when he stood up for working people in the Senate, we know what it meant to us, our homes, our streets, our communities. His impact was more real to Boston. We lived it every day, from Head Start to Meals on Wheels. More police on the streets, more students in college, more affordable housing to clean harbors. On your way out today, just a few hundred yards away, you'll pass a health center, the Geiger Gibson Health Center. It's a small clinic, but it has a big impact. In 1966, Senator Kennedy won its federal funding and more. He made it a model for community health centers legislation that brought high quality care to all families all across America. He listened to people of this neighborhood. He talked to the doctors who served them, and he shared their stories with his colleagues in the Senate. He changed this neighborhood and he changed this country for the better. Senator Kennedy was one of the most effective legislators in American history, not because he brought federal resources home, but because he brought our homes, our neighborhoods, and our voices to Washington. Our cares were his concern always. He fought for the children, he fought for the poor, he fought for the worker. And take it from me, a union laborer, American workers never had a better friend. As he told us, as he told us many times in many conferences in Washington, D.C., the way you spell Kennedy is L-A-B-O-R, and don't you forget it. And he never did. He showed us that democracy itself must be a labor of love, whether it's quietly visiting a grieving parent or writing a heartfelt note to a political opponent. He moved us forward by bringing us together. That's the people power of democracy. This institute will nurture right here in Boston. Senator Kennedy loved this city. The places were special to him and the people were special to him. Codman Square in Dorchester, Mission, Hill in Mission Church in Mission Hill, the Rose Kennedy Greenway that brought the downtown to new life. I want to thank everyone who helped create this new special place in our city, this labor of love, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. Here, generations of children from Dorchester, from Boston, from all over New England and America and the world will learn what we learned from Senator Kennedy, how to make their voices heard, fight for their causes, keep hope alive, and make sure their dreams shall never die. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Governor Charlie Baker. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all on behalf of the Commonwealth of Mass for being here today, and I want to congratulate all those who were involved in raising the money to make this possible. And I also want to thank the Kennedy family for choosing this site and this organization and this operation to pay tribute to Ted Kennedy. And Senator Lott, yeah, I'm a Republican governor from Massachusetts. <laughs> you know, many years ago, I was with a group of healthcare professionals, and we went down to Washington to meet with Senator Kennedy to talk about health care. And we got down there and we were told when we got to his office in the Rayburn building that the Senate was in session, but he could meet with us in a little ante room that was off the Senate chamber if we hustled over there and quickly. So we all hustled over there and gathered in this little room off the Senate chamber and he came bustling in and he sat down with us and for the next 30 to 40 minutes, we all talked with him about health care while literally a dozen members of the U.S. Senate at one point or another while we were talking poked their head in. And in those kinds of conversations you have with people that you really know, abbreviated little, hey, did you look after, yeah, I'm on that, and did you take, yeah, I got that, back and forth, back and forth between him and his colleagues in the U.S. Senate. And when we left that day, I thought to myself, in a business where it's so much easier to stop something from happening than it is to actually find your way to get something done, this is how this guy succeeds. Relationships, trust, follow through. It was all on display that day as a sidebar to the meeting that we were having about health care. And sure, Senator Kennedy absolutely was the Bigfoot for Massachusetts in so many ways if you needed somebody to help you get something done in D.C. But there's a special reason why so many pieces of legislation got passed with his name next to Republicans over the course of his career. It's because in that business, in that line of work, he knew how to build relationships, establish trust, and follow through to get the work of the Senate, the work of the nation, accomplished. And it wasn't just the big stuff. Every Friday night, for many years, I used to stop at a Chinese restaurant on my way home in Revere called Billy C's and pick up food for myself and for the legion of children who'd be hanging out at my house when I got there waiting for me to arrive. And one Friday night, it was about 7.30, it's a big group of us sitting around the kitchen table eating dinner, phone rings, and my six-year-old daughter walks over and answers the phone. She gets very quiet and a little demure, as only a six-year-old can. She comes, puts the phone down, comes over and says, Dad, there's some guy on the phone who says he's Senator Kennedy. <laughs> that then led to a lot of hilarity between and among my kids and my wife and everybody else about which one of my friends might be pranking me. So I went over and I answered the phone, and sure enough, it was Senator Kennedy. Friday night, 7.30, and he's calling me to thank me for agreeing to serve on the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy Board. We talked for a few minutes, said how important it was to him that it get done right, and if we ever had any questions or concerns, to feel free to give him a call. And I hung up the phone and I said, that was Senator Kennedy. <laughs> which no one believed. <laughs> but the interesting thing to me is this is somebody who played on the big issues and the big questions of his time in Washington. But I polled every member of that board, and we all got a phone call like that, and they came at all hours of the day and night and on weekends, and he stayed with that as we went through the process of launching that board and making that Greenway a reality. We live in a world in which people don't quite get some of what it takes to get stuff done in government. I dearly hope, as somebody who believes deeply in the capability and the quality of public life to truly make life better for everyone, that this building and this institute finds a way to communicate 
how important relationships, trust, and follow through are to truly being successful in public life. Because to me, that embodies what Senator Kennedy was all about. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Ed Markey. Mr. Vice President, Vicki, Kenny, Patrick, and your beautiful families. Ted loved all of you so much. You were the lights of his life. And he would be so proud of what you have accomplished together on this incredible day. Ted made impossible dreams come true as the greatest senator of all time in the United States of America. And you have made this possible today. And there could be no more perfect place for this innovative institute than UMass Boston, an extraordinary learning institution which educates children from just about every country in the world, all races, all countries, all incomes. This institution is what Ted Kennedy was all about. And deep appreciation to Jack Connors and Ann Finucane and John Fish and Fred Siegel and Nick Littlefield and Ed Schlossberg for the fantastic job they did in bringing us to this day. This 21st century edifice is now etched into the indelible history of this city and our nation. And much like Teddy Kennedy, the lasting impact of this institute will rise beyond our imagination. As a boy sitting on the floor in my living room, I watched on television as John F. Kennedy accepted the nomination for President of the United States. That moment opened up the windows of the world for me and for every young boy and girl in the United States. And then, in 1962, Ted Kennedy ran for the Senate for the first time against George Cabot Lodge. This was my political education about how a campaign for a senator could make an historic difference for Massachusetts and for our country. The undreamed of possibilities that Teddy and his brothers, President Kennedy and Bobby, shared inspired a generation to public service. The Kennedy brothers taught us to give back to our country which has given so much to us, and they taught us to be bold. That is what the legacy is of Ted Kennedy. And it was an honor to serve with and to learn from Ted Kennedy in Congress for 35 years. Teddy, Teddy's compassion was unmatched. His mentorship without peer, his dedication to justice unsurpassed, his ability to work across the aisle the best of any member of the United States Congress. And this institute, a hub of history, will take Teddy's personal touch and add the power of technology. It will showcase how effective public policies have fueled groundbreaking discoveries and progress across all fields. It will spread dreams across towns and nations, building bridges of understanding. It will demonstrate how leadership, teamwork, negotiation, and compromise are all essential ingredients of moving our country forward. You see, when I was first elected to Congress, the son of a milkman from Malden, I had never been to Washington, D.C. until the day of my swearing in as a member of the United States Congress. But now, at the Kennedy Institute, any young person can come here to learn and to experience how our democracy works, to stand on the Senate floor, to debate the big issues of our time. Teddy turned the Sermon on the Mount into the Sermon on the Senate floor. Blessed are the poor, 
the sick, the children, the elderly, and blessed are the peacemakers. For Teddy, blessed were those programs that address the needs of the most vulnerable amongst us. Blessed are Head Start, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, health care for all. And blessed are the peacemakers in Northern Ireland, in the Middle East, and on the urban streets of America. That is what Teddy Kennedy preached. And so while there is While there is no building that can match the strength of Teddy's soul, no material that could replicate the fiber of his character, no architecture that could begin to scrape the heights of his vision, this institute conveys the essence of Teddy, his joy and DNA for public service, and in doing so will inspire new leaders and more engaged citizens. For Teddy, education was always more than books. It was an opportunity, an experience to be grasped every day. Teddy found vision while holding the tiller of his sailboat or his lectern on the Senate floor. And he had great fun every minute. He was working on the most important issues in the world. And now, through its innovative ideas and time-honored ideals, the Institute, a place where hope and history will rhyme, will allow Teddy's lion heart courage and words to echo throughout time, and it will stir a new generation of dreamers to service. This institute will enable the leaders of tomorrow to learn, to participate, to soar, and to work together for a more educated, more healthy, more peaceful, and more fair nation and world. That is Ted Kennedy's legacy. That is what this institute is all about. This is truly a great day. Thank you all so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Elizabeth Warren. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today in Boston for such a wonderful day of celebration. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Jean and Fred, for your tremendous leadership to make this day possible. And thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Patrick, for your support, for your advice, and for your friendship. I am truly honored to be with you on such a happy day. We are here to dedicate the Kennedy Institute, a place designed with one of the loftiest goals possible, to inspire, to inspire, to encourage, to engage. It's a lofty goal, but it is the right one for an institute to honor Ted Kennedy. And here's how I know how. Back when I was a law professor, I studied the early signs that America's once strong middle class was in serious trouble. I studied people in bankruptcy, people who went to college, who got married, who had kids, who, who ended up pushed over a financial cliff. Solidly middle class folks, and more than 90% in bankruptcy because of a medical problem, a job loss, or a family breakup. The squeeze on the middle class was getting tighter, and more and more families were deep in debt. Bankruptcy was their last option to scratch their way back to dead flat broke and try to build some kind of future. Credit card companies saw this, and they figured out that they could boost their profits if they squeezed these people a little harder. So they wanted to change the bankruptcy laws so that hundreds of thousands more people every year would be locked out of bankruptcy and left mired in debt. Better profits by squeezing people, drowning in medical debt and dealing with job losses. I was truly appalled. Now, understand how this fight shaped up. Credit card companies were smart. They had already lined up a lot of powerful folks to support them, both Democrats and Republicans. They had money galore. They had lobbyists galore. And the families going bankrupt, they had nothing, literally nothing. They had no PACs. They had no lobbyists. They were miserable and so humiliated, they probably wouldn't have shown up for a political rally if they'd been invited. Senator Kennedy's counsel, Melody Barnes, had heard me give a talk. And she came up afterwards and she said to me, you need to meet my boss. 
I never met him. And it was April 17th, 1998. I showed up in his office on the 24th floor of the JFK building. Now, understand, I didn't know anything about politics. I'd never met anyone like this. In fact, I've been a registered Republican until a few years before that. But the senator agreed to meet with me. He greeted me like we've known each other forever. He swept me across the office and over to his windows and pointed out Old North Church and all kinds of other sites. Talked so fast I could barely understand him. We had 15 minutes on the schedule, and we sat down and started to talk about what was happening to working families, about how hard some of them were getting squeezed, about how hard they worked and how much was going wrong, and about that bankruptcy bill. And a 15-minute meeting turned into an hour and a half. And at the end, Senator, Senator Kennedy stood up, and he gave me that big, beautiful smile, and he said, you've done it, Professor. You have my vote. I looked straight back at him, and I said, we don't need your vote. We need your leadership. That's a big difference. You know, it's kind of like the difference between being the kindly uncle who drops by at the right time with a birthday gift and being the parent who really has to raise the kid every single day and make it work, to be the one who gets out there and trades and pushes and pulls. We needed him to agree to be the leader, and it was a really big ask. He stood there, and I remember exactly what he looked like. His eyes were puffy. He was a little stooped. He was in constant back pain. He looked tired, and he looked over at that big satchel of papers that he always carried, the satchel full of a zillion other commitments that he had already made, a zillion other fights that he'd already agreed to fight. He looked at it and looked back at me, looked again, and then he just said, I'll do it. And that's what he did kept his word, and he led that fight for 10 years. I left his office, and I went out to the elevator bank and put my head against the wall, and I cried. Senator Kennedy changed my life that day. I hadn't liked politics. All the lobbyists and cozy dealings and special favors for those who could buy access. But I stood in the lobby outside Ted Kennedy's office, and I felt clean. I'd come into his office with no political connections, no money. Improving the bankruptcy system certainly wasn't going to help in his next reelection campaign. And frankly, everyone knew that eventually we were going to lose this. But Senator Ted Kennedy, the lion of the Senate, agreed to lead this fight because it was the right thing to do for millions of people hanging on by their fingernails who just desperately needed a little help. He changed my life, and he changed what I understood about public service, what it means to fight for working people just because it's the right thing to do. This institute will give millions of people an opportunity to be inspired. That is the perfect way to honor the memory of Ted Kennedy. Thank you. Distinguished guests, the Senator Kennedy, as everybody here knows, loved music, loved the celebration, and you can't have one without the other. So we're happy to provide some of that. This is one of his favorite songs. Feel free to sing along. golden haze on the meadow there's a bright golden haze on the meadow the corn is as high as an elephant's eye and it looks like it's climbing 
clear up to the sky Oh, what a beautiful morning Oh, what a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way All the cattle are standing like statues All the cattle are standing like statues They don't turn their heads as they see me ride by is winking her eye Oh, what a beautiful morning Oh, what a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way All the sounds of the earth are like music All the sounds of the earth are like music The breeze is so busy it don't miss a tree And an old weeping willer is laughing at me What a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way Everybody sing it, keep you warm Oh, what a beautiful morning Oh, what a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Edward M. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank Keith Lockhart and the incredible Boston Pops uh, for being with us this morning. And I just want to say one thing. It's not true that my father really wanted to be president. Who he really wanted to be is uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell. That, that, is, that is the life that my father really wanted if he couldn't, if he, if he didn't have, uh, didn't love the United States Senate so much. I, uh, on behalf of the entire Kennedy family, thank you uh, for being here and thank you for joining us in this incredible celebration. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of introducing to you uh, a great American, an American hero. Um, the man I'm going to introduce uh, today uh, has served our country, not just worn the uniform, uh, but also has persevered. And in many ways, reminds me of my father in that way. His patriotism, his love of this country, his stick to and his willing to put aside differences and, and find ways to really get things done. Senator McCain, my father, and so enjoyed his collaboration with you year after year. 
And um, I think he really looked upon his Senate days working with you as some of the great moments of his Senate career. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Boston welcome to the, our friend, Senator John McCain. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> Vicki, Patrick, Mr. Vice President, all of Ted's family and friends and colleagues assembled here. It's a privilege to be with you today to help dedicate this wonderful institute, a fitting memorial to the men who gave a half century of dedicated and accomplished service to our country in a place he truly loved, the United States Senate. I wish I hadn't already told my best anecdote about Ted at his memorial service. It might have been appropriate here. It concerned an exchange he and I had on the Senate floor that was notable for its volume and vigor. <coughs> That's a good Kennedy word for you. A story that we both enjoyed telling. Since many of you were present the last time, I won't repeat it today. Pity, though, it's a good one. <laughs> we were on the floor. There were two freshman senators, one Democrat, one Republican, who got into a parliamentary dispute, and I saw it taking place, so I went down and naturally took the side of the freshman Republican senator, and who should appear out of the Democrat cloakroom to take the side of the Democrat freshman. Soon, face to face, eye to eye, violating all the rules of the Senate, yelling at each other. The two young senators fled, fled to the cloakrooms. <laughs> and after it was over, we walked out, Ted put his arm around me and said, we're a pretty good job, didn't we? <laughs> that was the essence. But you know, I, and I know you didn't mind hearing it again, but because Ted and I both believe that if a story made you laugh once, it could make you laugh again, and again, and again. I'm still getting laughs for jokes I stole from Mo Udall 30 years ago. I miss my friend. I miss him a lot. I knew I would when I said six years ago the Senate wouldn't be the same without him, and it hasn't been. That's mostly for reasons unrelated to losing Ted, but I have no doubt the place would be a little more productive and a lot more fun if he were there. We all know Ted was a passionate liberal. He was happy to impress on you with the booming baritone of his, just how passionate and how liberal any time he was challenged. I don't have a very timid personality myself. When either of us was roused to appropriate indignation, we could get a little heated. And if we were on the Senate floor at the same time and at the same temperature, well, watch out. It was a great thing, though, about Ted. He loved it. He loved a good fight. He had a real zest for political argument. And the harder you went at it, the more he enjoyed it, and the harder he laughed about it when you next encountered him. He loved the place. You could just tell. He loved its history and its unique attributes and its curious means for making incremental progress on the problems of our time. He saw himself as a steadfast advocate for his causes, and no one in the Senate opposed him lightly or debated him without respect for his passion and his powers. We all listened to him. He was hard to ignore. But he also saw himself as a problem solver, which all legislators should aspire to be. He didn't know what, we didn't always agree on what the solutions to our country's problems were. Sometimes we couldn't even agree on what the problems were. But when you did find common ground and forged a compromise solution for the sake of making some improvement in the state of our union, he was the best ally, persistent, patient, passionate, thorough, tireless, always true to his word and just excellent company in all the battles, small and large, that you fought along the way. He made you love the place, too, because you saw the Senate's potential 
in his many successes there, most of which were achieved by being as committed to the hard and sometimes dull work of legislating as he was to the more fun aspects of the job. He took the long view. He never gave up. He advanced his causes by degrees and often, too often from my side, he would eventually win it all. I'm less patient than Ted was, but I know his approach was best suited to the institution. He was the statesman in him, tactical, far-sighted, and inventive, that made the passionate, outspoken advocate so damn effective. That's a good lesson for all of us. As I said, I miss it. I miss his company. I miss that voice suddenly jolting us out of the torpor of some debate that had dragged it on, dragged on for too long. I miss fighting with him, to be honest. It's gotten harder to find people who enjoy a good fight as much as Ted did. <laughs> I miss his storytelling, his laugh. I miss the pride, the sometimes solemn pride, but often joyous pride he took in his family's history and the important role they played in the history of our country. No, the place hasn't been the same without him. But if we learn the right lessons from the late Edward M. Kennedy's example, from his love for and his achievements in the U.S. Senate, we can make it better. We can make it a place where every member can serve with pride and love. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy. I can just see my father out here this morning in the line. He'd be right out there wondering if you got a cup of coffee while you were waiting to get screened. Am I right? And then he'd say, I can't believe and eggs out the door, right, Kevin? I am so honored, my family's so honored. As I see this crowd here, I see my father. Because all of you are part of his life. And seeing you brings back great memories for me and my entire family. I want to take this moment, before I have the honor of introducing the Vice President, to acknowledge my mother, Joan Bennett Kennedy. my dad would be saying, make sure you remember your mother. <laughs> so I did, Dad, I did. Um, I want to take this opportunity, you know, in the Senate they have the phrase, my friend, and they keep referring to my friend. Well, it could never be more true than when he talked about Joe Biden. Mr. Vice President, you were there for him. He was there for you. In good times and in bad times, you were on the same side of the aisle, but you were sitting next to each other for years on the Judiciary Committee fighting that battle for social justice that was encapsulated in his mass card of Matthew 25. Those are the, who are there for the least one of these, my brothers and sisters, is there for me. And you, Mr. Vice President, have carried that same faith to help bring more Americans into the circle of opportunity, which was my father's great passion for this country. But all of us know Joe Biden, just like my dad, loved people, loved the fray, and loved to get into it and then solve the problem. And he was a happy warrior. And our next speaker, our Vice President, Joe Biden, is also 
a happy warrior. Please give a great round of applause to our Vice President, Joe Biden. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for the introduction, Patrick. Uh, Teddy Jr., Karen, Caroline, Vicky. Uh, the, uh, it's a great honor to be asked to speak here today. There are many others in the audience and behind me who, uh, who uh, deserve this honor more than I do. And to Joan and to Jean, uh, uh, the whole Kennedy family. Uh, my sister Valerie and I are, are truly honored to be here. You know, there are scores of stories that uh, we could all tell. My guess is every one of you in the audience has a story about Ted Kennedy's generosity and friendship toward you, stories uh, that uh, made a difference in your lives. But truth is, Patrick, it's doubtful that I would be uh, — that I would have won my election in the first instance were it not for your fact that your father, literally with uh, less than a week left to go, came to Wilmington, Delaware, rallied about uh, 2,000 Democrats, and uh, started off by saying, you know, I'm here for Joe Biden, but I think he's too young to be a senator. Everyone in the audience understood it. It energized them. I was then 29. I didn't turn 30 till after Election Day. But the next day in the Wall Street Journal, on that column on the left side, it said, Kennedy says Biden too young for Senate. <laughs> that just energized uh, my base, and I won by a landslide of 3,100 votes. <laughs> but on a more serious note, uh, it's close to certain that I would have never been sworn in as a United States Senator, but for your father, your father's encouragement, literally reaching out to me and pulling, uh, pulling me to Washington. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to go down to be sworn in. I didn't want to, and I didn't show up the day I was to be sworn in. It was your father, your father, who, along with Mike Mansfield, sent the uh, Secretary of the Senate to a hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, to swear me in with my boys. Uh, after uh, I arrived in Washington, your dad, uh, although it's presumptuous to say this, treated me like a little brother. At least that's how I felt. When I arrived in Washington, after everyone else had been sworn in, your dad became my tutor and uh, my guide. He introduced me to other senators who I'd never met. I'm the first United States senator other than him I ever knew. And uh, so it was new. And I remember him taking me into the Senate gymnasium and all these very, very famous, famous senators. He was trying to get me out of my office, get me engaged. And I remember walking in in the Senate chamber, uh, in the Senate gym, uh, like in a YMCA, the, uh, the men walk around between the shower and the stalls with nothing on. And I remember walking in and saying, Joe, I'd like you to meet Jack Javits. And I remember going, how are you? <laughs> I swear to God. Why don't you meet Jennings Randolph? I said, okay. <laughs> I was like, I felt guilty I was fully clothed. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> oh, God, was I embarrassed. Uh, and your dad also uh, intervened uh, and got me placed on important committees usually not available to freshman senator. He not only looked out for me, but he looked out for my son's uh, bow and hunt. I remember, I don't know how many times he probably dragged you guys to the Kennedy Senator and let me sit in the box next to you with my two sons. And you guys are wondering, what in the hell are we doing here? But you were always reaching out to my sons and later my wife, Jill, and my daughter, Ashley. It's something about 
Teddy Kennedy. It's something about the Kennedys. But you all know it. Everyone in here understands it. He was an anchor to many of us in our personal lives, but he's also the anchor in an institution that we revered. We shared a lot of perspectives on the world and our place in it, but one that was written on our sleeves was we both viewed serving in the United States Senate as the single greatest honor and the greatest responsibility we had in our lives next to being fathers and husbands. We both believed, and I still believe, that our democracy would not have survived as it has over the past 226 years, but for the brilliance and foresight of our founders, students of Montesquieu and Locke, who, who understood that the separation of powers among the three branches of the government was the only and ultimate guarantor of individual liberty. As a U.S. Senator, the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, a Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, now as Vice President, I've lived that wisdom from a very unique perspective. And with Teddy as my guide. In the Senate, we worked with eight presidents of both parties. I watched him challenge them when he thought they were wrong, while always paying deference to the office they occupied, never demeaning it. I served with them 32 years on the Judiciary Committee, sitting next to him, watched him fight tooth and nail for equal justice for all, but always, always with the deep belief in the indispensability and independence of the role of the judiciary, the only sure guarantee of our justice. But what he really taught me was the meaning of John Adams' observation that the Senate was the colossus, in Adams' words, the colossus of the Constitution. Adams said, no republic can ever be for any duration without a Senate. And a Senate deeply and strongly rooted, strong enough to bear up against all popular storms and passions. I think he believed that with every fiber in his being. I had a front row seat, which I can never repay the family for, for 36 years of his nearly 50 years in the Senate, watching the liberal line of the Senate watching with a never-ending sen sense of awe, including the last time he walked on the floor of the Senate to cast a vote for the health care bill, the Affordable Care Act. And as divided as the body was on that act, every single senator stood with thunderous applause and tears in their eyes, welcoming back the line of the Senate knowing his passion from the day he entered that body was to see to it that we no longer debated whether or not health care was a privilege or a right. He debated. <laughs> I watched him, as John said, debate and contest some of the most divisive and important storms and passions of our time. The Voting Rights Act, the Equal Rights Amendment, Watergate, the wars in Vietnam and Iraq, the worthiness of Supreme Court nominees to serve in a body that he fully understood and told us all would have more impact and effect on the fate of the nation than anything we did other than declaring war. And what I observed in every instance was that as passionate as he felt, he always paid deference and respect to the institutions that were involved, whether it was the presidency, the federal judiciary, or the Congress. And the other observation that all those present here who serve with him can attest to, Teddy understood that to unlock the potential of the United States Senate to enable it to arrive at consensus was about more than just mastering the details of the issue of the day, and he did master them. He understood that consensus was arrived at from the cumulative effect. I emphasize the cumulative effect 
of personal relationships, the little things that you did for the other, built over time. That's what generated the trust and the mutual respect in the comedy that only Teddy was able to do. Forgive me for saying in the city of Tip O'Neill, but I think he was wrong that all politics is local. All politics is personal. All politics is personal. And no one, no one in my life understood that better than Ted Kennedy. I remember vividly as a young senator, we still had a lot of the old anti-civil rights members of the South, nine to be exact, when I arrived. And Teddy was their nemesis. I remember him debating Senator Jim Eastland of the Judiciary Committee, a powerful anti-civil rights chairman of the Judiciary Committee, or Barry Goldwater on the war in Vietnam, or John McCain <laughs> on issues of foreign policy and others. Three very different men with very different perspectives. But when the debate was over, as John referenced, Teddy would, and would inevitably walk across the aisle to his colleague's desk, shake his hand, and more often than not, they'd go down to the Senate dining room to get a cup of coffee together. He reached out to everyone, always, always building and maintaining personal relationships and trust, even those with whom he had profound, profound disagreements. Teddy didn't have to be taught the lesson that the Majority Leader Mike Mansfield taught me once when I criticized the senator in his office. He looked at me and he said, Joe, it's always appropriate to challenge another senator's judgment. It's never appropriate to challenge their motive because you don't know what their motive is. That's why Teddy was able to so frequently forge compromise and generate consensus, and in the process, help make the United States Senate work as it was designed to work. He believed what he said, that being a United States Senator changes a person. It's bigger than you, and it requires you to always be willing to listen to another perspective and to be open to changing your mind without betraying any of your principles. As my dad would say, Teddy was a big man. He was never small. He was always gracious. And as a consequence, he raised everybody's game. It's hard to be petty when the man or woman you're debating is being grand and magnanimous. It reminds me of the quote my sister always uses attributed to Michelangelo, who was a sculptor at heart. He said, Michelangelo allegedly said, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set him free. Teddy set free a lot of folks. He appealed to their better angels. That was Teddy. He set a really high bar for his fellow senators, like the former and current ones who are here today. And one he demanded no less be applied to himself and his staff. Teddy was always optimistic, at least all the time I was ever with him. And that was an awful lot. Always hopeful. Because I believe, like too few people today, he believed in the basic instincts and capacities and goodness of the American people, if just given half a chance. He believed that if you listen to the other guy, the other woman, if you actually listen, you might sign something about their argument that made sense, that anything was possible. Ultimately, from my perspective, I think that's Teddy's true legacy. Measured as a consequence of how we look at one another and, in turn, how we look at ourselves to establish trust and faith in an institution 
and an institution with the potential to make us all better. And that's what I expect the Edward M. Kennedy Institute of the United States to fully convey to the future generations of America who are going to wander through this magnificent place. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not stating anything you don't already know. This country hungers for a resurgence of a baseline belief in a system of self-governance admired for its wisdom in the face of passionate differences and for the ability to compromise seemingly unbridgeable divides with some dignity and some dispatch. And I'm confident that this institute will serve and satisfy that appetite. The pundits say that we are uh, we are divided today. We are more divided than we ever were. Well, that's simply not true. Look at every major poll. On every major issue, there's a consensus in America. It's the political process that has been broken. And generations of Americans from every state will enter this institute with the chance to debate and raise real issues and develop the capacity to speak up and make their case. But I hope they'll learn always with respect. And hopefully they'll return home empowered with the capacity to listen to different views, to be able to forge a consensus that makes it possible for their community and their country to function to its fullest potential. What more fitting tribute to Senator Edward M. Kennedy than that lesson to be not only learned but felt by so many generations of young women and men who will walk through this institute. As I said, he was the anchor of our personal lives, and he was an anchor for the Senate as an institution. Let this place serve as a true compass pointing toward his unyielding faith in the limitless possibilities of the American people and this country. Thank you for allowing me to be here. May God bless you all. May God protect our people. Beautiful. Uh, these are two songs that I think beautifully capture the heart and the spirit, not only of Senator Kennedy, but the heart and spirit of what this institution will be. Oh, beautiful. For spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that see beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam 
undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea I see his face, I hear his heartbeat, I look in those eyes, how wise they seem, well when he I will show him America and he will ride on the wheels of a dream. We'll go down south and see Travel on from there, California, oh, who knows where, and we will ride on the wheels of a dream. Yes, the wheels are turning for us now. And the times are starting to roll Any man can get where he wants to If he's got some fire in his soul We'll see justice coming And plenty of men who will stand up And give us our due I swear that it's more than promises Swear that it must be true a country that lets a man like me hold a car, raise a child, build a life with you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Mrs. Michelle Obama, and Mrs. Victoria Reggie Kennedy.
Mr. President, Mrs. Obama, Mr. Vice President, Governor Baker, leaders Lott and Daschle, Senators McCain, Warren and Markey, Mayor Walsh, Dr. Jean McCormick, Bob Corrett, Keith Motley, Cardinal O'Malley, to all of the senators, members, and elected officials who have joined us today, to the Boston Pops, the Children's Choir, Stokes Mitchell, friends. On behalf of Ted's sister Jean, Ted Jr. and Kiki, Patrick and Amy, Curran, Caroline, and the entire Kennedy family standing beside me literally and in spirit, we are honored and grateful you all could be here. 36 years ago, my husband came here to dedicate the Presidential Library next door. Speaking about the older brother he loved and admired so deeply, Teddy called the moment a culmination, a happy rendezvous with history that makes his memory come alive. Today, the same is true for all of us who loved Edward M. Kennedy. It seems like only yesterday I was standing with Teddy at a window on the seventh floor of the JFK Library, looking down on the plot of land where this institute now stands. It was an empty, low-lying field, but he had a vision that something extraordinary could rise from it. As we looked out that window, Teddy pointed to a little pine tree and said to me, that's where the Institute is going to be. And we stood there for a moment, imagining what it would look like, an Institute with a full-scale recreation of the U.S. Senate right here in Boston, the city of his birth that he loved so much. Now, thanks to the heroic efforts of so many incredible people, that chamber and this institute stand exactly where Teddy dreamed they would. But as was Teddy's wish, this institute is not about one man. It's about the nearly 2,000 men and women who have served in the United States Senate since it first convened. And it's about those who might be inspired to serve in it in the future, if they only knew more about the important role of the Senate in our democracy. Teddy used to say, everyone knows about the presidency. We have presidential libraries but they don't know so much about the Senate and the legislative process. Then he'd smile, that famous smile of his, and say with more than a little hint of mischief, after all, we're in Article I of the Constitution. <laughs> Teddy loved the United States Senate. He loved the history and the great senators of the past. And he loved the great senators he served with. He loved the building. He loved the Senate chamber. Most of all, he loved the difference the Senate could make, securing Americans' rights, helping them get health care or jobs, strengthening America's leadership in the world. Sure, the Senate has seen its share of disagreements, sometimes sharp ones. But as Teddy understood, that was part of the process. Our founders never intended legislating to be easy. It requires hard work. And as all of us who knew Teddy understand, he worked hard at it because he believed that the United States Senate had the power to change lives, the lives of people in this country, the lives of people around the world. He served in the United States Senate for nearly 47 years, and he noticed something during that time. When you became a senator, something changed inside you. Maybe not the first year or the second, 
maybe not even in the third year, but at some point, almost always, something happened. You started to think about more than yourself. You started to think about the country. And Teddy wanted to build a place where everyone could feel the same way. A place where all of us could start thinking about our country. The institute you see today is a realization of that dream. And just as Teddy approached politics differently, he wanted to approach the Institute in a completely fresh and unique way. So we have a totally hands-on, interactive visitor experience. And it is an experience. Visitors interact not only with the exhibits, but with each other. We're using the best of technology while encouraging face-to-face -face interaction and negotiation. It's an entirely new model of civic engagement. And at the center of it all is that magnificent, full-scale recreation of the Senate chamber. That recreation was so important to Teddy. He believed in the majesty of the place and its power to inspire. And he felt that no experience as a senator would be complete without understanding the awe you felt walking into that chamber. As student groups have visited in the last few months, we have seen that in action. There'll be a buzz in the hallways, talking about issues or exhibits, but as soon as they walk through those double doors, a hush comes over them. They seem to know instinctively they're in a very special place. In that space, they'll try to pass the Compromise of 1850, or hash out immigration reform, or some issue that's not even on the agenda yet. And when they do, they'll learn a lot more than which senator was responsible for what bill. We hope they'll also learn that despite our disagreements, if we sit down and talk to each other and listen to each other, perhaps then we can find common ground. Perhaps then, together, we can make incredible progress. Teddy hoped that everyone who came to this institute would realize that politics, and he called it politics, is a noble profession, even if it's messy, even if it's hard. Teddy wanted people, young people in particular, to rise above and move beyond reports of gridlock and poll numbers and become active participants in our democracy. Whether that means serving in the Senate or on the school board or just voting without fail. Because as far as Teddy was concerned, if we all did our part, there was nothing we couldn't accomplish. We are Americans, he said. This is what we do. We reach the moon. We scale the heights. I know it. I've seen it. I've lived it, and we can do it again. The Edward M. Kennedy Institute is going to inspire us to do it again. Teddy actually spoke those words in 2008 at the Democratic National Convention. Despite his own illness, he was looking to the future, and he was looking forward to speaking on behalf of a dear friend, the then junior senator from Illinois, a legislator Teddy had recruited to his Senate committee, and there was no higher compliment than that. So it is my great honor to introduce a man my husband loved and admired so much, he gave him a puppy. <laughs> a man who understands the power and promise of our democracy. A man who stood up and fought for, and at long last, signed a bill enshrining in law what Teddy called the cause of his life, health care for all Americans. And a man, and a man who was also a United States Senator. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Barack Obama.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. To Vicki, Ted, Patrick, Kern, Caroline, Ambassador Smith, members of the Kennedy family, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Your Eminence, Cardinal O'Malley, Vice President Biden, Governor Baker, Mayor Walsh, members of Congress, past and present, and pretty much every elected official in Massachusetts. <laughs> it is an honor to mark this occasion with you. Boston, know that Michelle and I have joined our prayers with yours these past few days for a hero, the former Army Ranger and Boston police officer John Moynihan, who was shot in the line of duty on Friday night. I mention him because last year at the White House, the Vice President and I had the chance to honor Officer Moynihan as one of America's top cops for his bravery in the line of duty, for risking his life to save a fellow officer. And thanks to the heroes at Boston Medical Center, I'm told Officer Moynihan is awake and talking, and we wish him a full and speedy recovery. I also want to single out someone who very much wanted to be here, just as he was every day for nearly 25 years, as he represented this Commonwealth alongside Ted in the Senate, and that's Secretary of State John Kerry. As many of you know, John is in Europe with our allies and partners, leading the negotiations with Iran and the world community and standing up for a principle that Ted and his brother, President Kennedy, believed in so strongly. Uh, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. And finally, <laughs> finally, in his first years in the Senate, Ted dispatched a young aide to assemble a team of talent without rival. The cell was simple. Come and help Ted Kennedy make history. And so I want to give a special shout out to his extraordinarily loyal staff. Fifty years later, a family more than 1,000 strong. This is your day as well. We're proud of you. Of course, many of you now work with me. So enjoy today, because we got to get back to work. Distinguished guests, fellow citizens, in 1958, Ted Kennedy was a young man working to re-elect his brother Jack to the United States Senate. On election night, the two toasted one another. Here's to 1960, Mr. President, Ted said, if you can make it. And with his quick Irish wit, Jack returned the toast. Here's to 1962, Senator Kennedy, if you can make it. They both made it. And today, they're together again in eternal rest at Arlington. But their legacies are as alive as ever, together right here in Boston. The John F. Kennedy Library next door is a symbol of our American idealism. The Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate as a living example of the hard, frustrating, never-ending, but critical work required to make that idealism real. What more fitting tribute, what better testament to the life of Ted Kennedy than this place that he left for a new generation of Americans. A monument not to himself, but to what we, the people, have the power to do together. Any of us who've had the privilege to serve in the Senate 
know that it's impossible not to share Ted's awe for the history swirling around you, an awe instilled in him by his brother Jack. Ted waited more than a year to deliver his first speech on the Senate floor. That's no longer the custom. <laughs> It's good to see Trent and Tom Daschle here, because they remember what customs were like back then. And Ted uh, gave a speech only because he felt there was a topic, the Civil Rights Act, that demanded it. Nevertheless, he spoke with humility, aware, as he put it, that a freshman senator should be seen, not heard, should learn, and not teach. Some of us, I admit, have not always heeded that lesson. <laughs> but fortunately, we had Ted to show us the ropes anyway. And no one made the Senate come alive like Ted Kennedy. It was one of the great pleasures of my life to hear Ted Kennedy deliver one of his stem winders on the floor. Rarely was he more animated than when he'd lead you through the living museums that were his offices. He could, and he would, tell you everything <laughs> that there was to know about all of it. <laughs> and then there were more somber moments. I still remember the first time I pulled open the drawer of my desk. Each senator is assigned a desk, and there's a tradition of carving the names of those who had used it before. And those names in my desk included Taft and Baker, Simon, Wellstone, and Robert F. Kennedy. The Senate was a place where you instinctively pulled yourself up a little bit straighter where you tried to act a little bit better. Being a senator changes a person, Ted wrote in his memoirs. As Vicki said, it may take a year or two years or three years, but it always happens. It fills you with a heightened sense of purpose. That's the magic of the Senate. That's the essence of what it can be. And who but Ted Kennedy and his family would create a full-scale replica of the Senate chamber and open it to everyone? We live in a time of such great cynicism about all our institutions. And we are cynical about government and about Washington most of all. It's hard for our children to see in the noisy and too often trivial pursuits of today's politics, the possibilities of our democracy, our capacity together to do big things. And this place can help change that. It can help light the fire of imagination, plant the seed of noble ambition in the minds of future generations. Imagine a gaggle of school kids clutching tablets, turning classrooms into cloakrooms and hallways into hearing rooms, assign an issue of the day and the responsibility to solve it. Imagine their moral universe expanding as they hear about the momentous battles waged in that chamber and how they echo throughout today's society. Great questions of war and peace, the tangled bargains between North and South, federal and state, the original sins of slavery and prejudice, the unfinished battles for civil rights and opportunity and equality. Imagine the shift in their sense of what's possible the first time they see a video of senators who look like they do, men and women, blacks and whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, those born to great wealth, but also those born of incredibly modest means. 
Imagine what a child feels the first time she steps onto that floor, before she's old enough to be cynical, before she's told what she can't do, before she's told who she can't talk to or work with, what she feels when she sits at one of those desks, what happens when it comes her turn to stand and speak on behalf of something she cares about and cast a vote and have a sense of purpose. It's maybe just not for kids. What if we all carried ourselves that way? What if our politics, our democracy, were as elevated, as purposeful as she imagines it to be right here? Towards the end of his life, Ted reflected on how Congress has changed over time. And those who served earlier, I think, have those same conversations. It's a more diverse, more accurate reflection of America than it used to be, and that is a grand thing, a great achievement. But Ted grieved the loss of camaraderie and collegiality, the face-to-face -face interaction. I think he regretted the arguments now made to cameras instead of colleagues, directed at a narrow base instead of the body politic as a whole, the outsized influence of money and special interests, and how it all leads more Americans to turn away in disgust and simply choose not to exercise their right to vote. Now, since this is a joyous occasion, this is not the time for me to suggest a slew of new ideas for reform, although I do have some. <laughs> Maybe I'll just mention one. What if we carried ourselves more like Ted Kennedy? What if we worked to follow his example a little bit harder? To his harshest critics, who saw him as nothing more than a partisan lightning rod, that may sound foolish, but there are Republicans here today for a reason. They know who Ted Kennedy was. It's not because they shared Ted's ideology or his positions, but because they knew Ted as somebody who bridged the partisan divide over and over and over again with genuine effort and affection in an era when bipartisanship has become so very rare. They knew him as somebody who kept his word. They knew him as somebody who was willing to take a half a loaf and endure the anger of his own supporters to get something done. They knew him as somebody who was not afraid. And fear so permeates our politics instead of hope. People fight to get in the Senate and then they're afraid. We fight to get these positions and then don't want to do anything with them. And Ted understood the only point of running for office was to get something done. Not to posture. Not to sit there worrying about the next election or the polls. To take risks. He understood that differences of party or philosophy could not become barriers to cooperation or respect. He could howl an injustice on the Senate floor like a force of nature, while nervous aides tried to figure out which chart to pull up next. <laughs> but in his personal dealings, 
He answered Edmund Randolph's call to keep the Senate a place to restrain, if possible, the fury of democracy. I did not know Ted as long as some of the speakers here today. But he was my friend. I owe him a lot. And as far as I could tell, it was never ideology that compelled him, except insofar as his ideology said, you should help people, that you should have a life of purpose, that you should be empathetic, be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see through their eyes. His tirelessness, his restlessness, they were rooted in his experience. By the age of 12, he was a member of a Gold Star family. By 36, two of his brothers were stolen from him in the most tragic public of ways. By 41, he nearly lost a beloved child to cancer. And that made suffering something he, he knew. And it made him more alive to the suffering of others. While his son was sleeping after treatment, Ted would wander the halls of the hospital, meet other parents, keeping vigil over their own children. They were parents terrified of what would happen when they couldn't afford the next treatment. Parents working out what they could sell or borrow or mortgage just to make it a few more months. And then, if they had to, bargain with God for the rest. There in the quiet night, working people of modest means and one of the most powerful men in the world shared the same intimate, immediate sense of helplessness. He didn't see them as some abstraction. He knew them. He felt them. Their pain was his. As much as they might be separated by wealth and fame, and those families would be at the heart of Ted's passions. Just like the young immigrant, he would see himself in that, ch that child. They were his cause, the sick child who couldn't see a doctor, the young soldier sent to battle without armor, the citizen denied her rights because of what she looked like or where she came from or who she loves. He quietly attended as many military funerals in Massachusetts as he could for those who fell in Iraq and Afghanistan. He called and wrote each one of the 177 families in this commonwealth who lost a loved one on 9-11. And he took them sailing and played with their children, not just in the days after, but every year after. His life's work was not to champion those with wealth or power or connections. They already had enough representation. It was to give voice to the people who wrote and called him from every state, desperate for somebody who might listen and help. It was about what he could do for others. That's why he'd take his hearings to hospitals in rural towns and inner cities and push people out of their comfort zones, including his colleagues, because he had pushed himself out of his comfort zone. And he tried to instill in his colleagues that same sense of empathy, even if they called him, as one did, wrong at the top of his lungs, even if they might disagree with him 99 percent of the time. Because who knew what might happen with that other 1 percent? Orrin Hatch was sent to Washington in part because he promised to fight Ted Kennedy. And they fought a lot. 
One was a conservative Mormon from Utah, after all. The other one was, well, Ted Kennedy. <laughs> but once they got to know one another, they, they discovered certain things in common. The devout faith, the soft spot for health care, very fine singing voices. In 1986, when Republicans controlled the Senate, Orrin held the first hearing on the AIDS epidemic, even hugging an AIDS patient. An incredible and very important gesture at the time. The next year, Ted took over the committee and continued what Orrin started. When Orrin's father passed away, Ted was one of the first to call. And it was over dinner at Ted's house one night that they decided to try and ensure the 10 million children who didn't have access to health care. As that debate hit roadblocks in Congress, as apparently debates over health care tend to do, Ted would have his chief of staff serenade Orrin to court his support. When hearings didn't go Ted's way, he might puff on a cigar to annoy Orrin, who disdained smoking. When they didn't go Orrin's way, he might threaten to call Ted's sister Eunice. And when it came time to find a way to pay for the children's health insurance program that they together had devised, Ted pounced, offering a tobacco tax and asking, are you for Joe Camel and the Marlboro Man or millions of children who lack adequate health care? It was the kind of friendship unique to the Senate, calling to mind what John Calhoun once said of Henry Clay. I don't like Clay. He is a bad man, an imposter, a creator of wicked schemes. I wouldn't speak to him, but by God, I love him. So sure, Orrin Hatch once called Ted one of the major dangers to the country. <laughs> but he also stood up at a gathering in Ted's last months and said, I'm asking you all to pray for Ted Kennedy. The point is, we can fight on almost everything. But we can come together on some things. And those some things can mean everything to a whole lot of people. It was common ground that led Ted and Orrin to forge a compromise that covered millions of kids with health care. It was common ground rooted in the plight of loved ones that led Ted and Chuck Grassley to cover kids with disabilities, that led Ted and Pete Domenici to fight for equal rights for Americans with a mental illness. Common ground, not rooted in abstractions or stubborn rigid ideologies, but shared experience that led Ted and John McCain to work on a patient's bill of rights and to work to forge a smarter, more just immigration system. A common desire to fix what's broken. A willingness to compromise in pursuit of a larger goal. A personal relationship that lets you fight like heck on one issue and shake hands on the next, not through just cajoling or horse trading or serenades, but through Ted's brand of friendship and kindness and humor and grace. What binds us together across our differences in religion or politics or economic theory, Ted wrote in his memoirs, is all we share as human beings. The wonder that we experience when we look at the night sky the gratitude that we know when we feel the heat of the sun, the sense of humor in the face of the unbearable, and the persistence of suffering. And one thing more, the capacity to reach across our differences to offer a hand of healing. For all the challenges of a changing world, for all the imperfections of our democracy, the capacity to reach across our differences is something that's entirely up to us. 
May we all, in our own lives, set an example for the kids who enter these doors and exit with higher expectations for their country. May we all remember the times this American family has challenged us to ask what we can do, to dream and say, why not, to seek a cause that endures and sail against the wind in its pursuit and live our lives with that heightened sense of purpose. Thank you. May God bless you. May you continue to bless this country we love. Thank you.